Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with town of Wembley, Alberta, Councillor Becky Ketchup. Wembley, Alberta is a thriving town located west of Grand Prairie, proudly claiming its spot in the heart of the action. Established in 1924, it shifted four and a half miles south of Lake Saskatoon to its present location, embracing the name Wembley after the English community. Famed for Herman Terrell, five-time Wheat King of the World, Wembley's wheat-themed logo honors its strong farming roots. Serving as the gateway to prehistoric wonders as well, the town hosts the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum near the renowned Pipestone Creek area, home to the world's largest Pachyrhinosaurus bone bed. With a rich array of amenities and an open-for-business spirit, Wembley beckons as an ideal place to call home. This is Cross-Border Interviews with Councillor Becky Ketchum. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to participate on the show. I want to start by getting to know the persona behind the councillor's chair. So for you, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Becky? I spent a little while trying to figure out what happened there. <laughs> uh, I think it was a mixture of a few things. Um course a big one just wanting to have that representation around the table of something a little bit different that maybe we weren't seeing previously on our council in our town uh, a little bit of um, maybe just having kids and having my family and my parents and stuff that are um, seniors now and just wanting to be able to uh, sort of have a say or a perspective on what we're doing for those groups of people in our community. Um, but it probably went back further than just current situation. I think I've always kind of been, even as a kid, as the person who needed to know how and why. Like you could tell me that's the answer, but who decided that was the answer? Why, what was that background information? You know, one of those people that Google's like, who decided that we said, I don't know, bless you when you sneezed. <laughs> Why did they decide that? <laughs> Looking up the information, but I think that's kind of where it goes back to is, yeah, this is the way our town is. These are the bylaws. These are the policies. But why? Who decided? And what are the, are those the best ways or the only ways? Are there different perspectives? And, and is there a way we can change them, I guess? So that you, that could have spawned you into many different realms. That could have been a teacher, that could have been a historian, a researcher, but you chose in 2021, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first election you stand in, this is yeah. your first term on office, um, you decide in 2021 to stand for election. Prior to that decision about getting involved municipally to help out locally, had you considered running in politics prior to that? Or was politics the furthest thing from your mind? Definitely wasn't something I had, you know, dreamt of as a child. <laughs> <laughs> was mom um, and dad political? Were they like, were they involved in the community or involved, are you like the black sheep of the family and <laughs> you're the first elected official? No, my mom, um, my sister, a lot of them have a lot of um, not necessarily in this community, but volunteering and growing up playing a lot of sports. I coached and played and did all that kind of stuff. At the time that I ran, I think there was a lot going on, obviously, and not just our community, but in the world with coming out of the pandemic and everybody felt unsure and uneasy. I think there was a huge strain on mental health, especially um, small communities, maybe not Maybe it wasn't felt more in small communities, but I think it was more noticed because, you know, you know, your neighbor, you know, um, I subbed at the school as an EA. So you see the students that are struggling and the teachers that are struggling. And I think maybe it just kind of got the, I don't want to sit on my hands. Is there something we can do uh, to help or, or maybe just, like I said, figure out why and how these things are happening. And if there's something we can do to maybe boost morale and mental health and physical health in our community. And I think that's kind of why I decided to throw my name in there to begin with. 
So you put your name forward and being on the ballot and actually going out and door knocking and visiting people and asking for their opinion yet again, 2021, it was a different experience for a lot of first term <laughs> politicians who had never gone through that experience. But for you, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, you have a pulse on your community. You have an idea of what seniors are wanting with your experience from your mom and dad. You have experience from being uh, with the children. But hearing people's concerns is always something that will always be in your heart because you, you, you hear from people what they're struggling with, what they're going through. For you, what was that experience like hearing and talking to people about their concerns? Because you always have your own concerns, but as a counselor, as an elected official, you have to represent their concerns. So what was that moment like for you? Um, it was definitely a learning curve. So I was also working at our local bank. I part-time managed the bank here at the time. And so our primary clientele were our seniors in town. So we chatted during the pandemic. We were their mental health hub, I guess. And they'd come in and hang out for a long time and tell us all of the things that were happening in their lives. And being an empathetic person, and I am probably a pretty emotional person too, which I think probably helps a little bit in this job, just because I think people feel that you are legitimately and feeling for them and concerned and want to change things. So, you know, we'd have seniors coming in in tears and, you know, down to their last dollar in their bank account. And the food banks are only open on Saturdays and in, in our community anyways. And I think um, the listening. Yeah. It brings up a good point because mm -hmm your role as counselor, you have to make some pretty tough choices. So in the last two years, you've had to make some pretty tough choices, whether it be through budget, whether it be through uh, service levels, you are the responsible one to do that. Mm -hmm. How much weight as an empathetic person, as you've just said, do you put on yourself to come into those meetings when you get that package informed on how you're going to vote decided on who you're talking to out in the community to inform your vote, but be empathetic because the decisions you make are going to impact the people that you saw at the bank when you were first running. Yeah. You know, it impacts them, my friends, my family and everybody. And I think you do, you get the package. <laughs> you're trying to be as informed as possible. And you probably, I shouldn't say you probably, you definitely do come into the meeting thinking, um, I'm most concerned about, say, social programming. I'm most concerned about um, maintaining a service level in our community that keeps everybody happy, comfortable, and safe. I think safety was a huge thing, too. Um, but then sometimes you sit down at the table and you think, and I think that's something I enjoy a lot about councils. You, you think, I've made up my decision, and then you hear all these other perspectives you have people coming in as delegations telling you their stories and what they need this funding for and being open-minded and willing to say i think i i think i had this wrong and then reevaluating and going back to the table and saying i'll be the first one to admit i didn't want this but i think we need <laughs> we need to turn the tables a little bit on that is that hard? Is that hard to, because traditionally humans don't like to admit when they're wrong, <laughs> but when you're a counselor, you have to look at all sides of the equation and you're in a sort of a situation where you're making decisions at a table in the public. I'm assuming people can come and watch your meetings and you have to make those decisions on a sort of day-to-day -day or weekly basis when you have those council meetings. Is it hard to look at each individual issue as an individual issue without forgetting about the larger town as a whole, because you only have an unlimited supply. Of, you only have a limited supply of money and you can't help everyone, right? Very limited amount of supply of money, unfortunately. <laughs> what, um, LGFF didn't help you guys this year? I don't know if I should comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's hard to admit that you're wrong for sure. I don't think anybody likes that hit to an ego, but I actually, I think I enjoy finding out that maybe I was wrong. Just, I really enjoy that information portion of that. And we have a couple of counselors on our table that have been here for a while and know a lot of things that I just, I don't know. So I come in, 
I can state an opinion that I have or a perspective that I have and be shot out of the sky on it and have all this information given to me. And maybe at first I feel a little defeated, but I actually really enjoy figuring that out and learning that. So, I mean, hard, but I do kind of like being proven wrong a little bit, which sounds weird. <laughs> I love the honesty of this interview yeah. already. Um, your role is to represent the people who voted for you and the people who didn't vote for you. And that mm-hmm. means sometimes you have to listen to people who may vehemently disagree with some of the statements or some of the positions you take. As the closest to the people, how important is it for yourself to get outside of that echo chamber that we all traditionally try to stay within and listen to the people who agree with us? Because your role is to listen to both sides. And sometimes that means respectfully, if the people are doing it correctly, respectfully listening to the people who disagree with you. Um, I think the good and the bad part about being in a small town in a world (laughs) of social media is that no matter what you do, you're probably going to actually hear more from the people who disagree with you than you're going to hear from the ones that agree with you. And I think it's blowing my mind here, (laughs) counselor. You're blowing my mind. Oh my God. It's like first time you ever heard that, right? (laughs) The negative people are way louder than the positive people. I think I just keep into perspective that the people that are constantly negative about things don't represent the majority of our community. They represent a small majority. However, that doesn't make their opinion less valid and their feelings less valid. And I think still taking into consideration if there is a way that we can mitigate, make this group of people also feel like they've been heard, like they're valid, that there are changes that we're trying to make to accommodate this group of people, whichever it might be. I think that's just as important, even if it's not the majority, even if it's not the statistic, maybe it doesn't fit into the budget, maybe it doesn't, but still saying, I appreciate your opinion. I'm glad you reached out. Like, I think that we kind of forget that a little bit, maybe as counselors, as a, in politics in general, just because you're the smaller group, doesn't mean that your opinion or your, how you're feeling shouldn't be accounted for in some way. Since starting the show, I, I've learned mm-hmm. a lot about the apathy when it comes to municipal politics. Mm-hmm. And I and I and I respectfully say this as the host of the show, this is not the counselor, so please send your emails to me, not her. Um when something happens federally, people get angry, they go to social media. When something happens provincially, they go to social media, they get angry what's going on in Edmonton. But locally, traditionally, you don't see that many people getting involved in coming to a council meeting and watching a three hour council meeting or a 20 minute council meeting or a seven hour They'd council be so meeting. Bored. <laughs> exactly. Until you get your tax notice, that's when you start realizing what's going on mm-hmm. in Wembley. Do you see an apathetic nature? So when you go out to the general public asking for their feedback on certain issues that are facing the community, are people willing to give their opinions on to you, like directly to you? Or are they sort of just saying, okay, as long as my water's turned on and my garbage is picked up, I'm comfortable with what's going on at City Hall. I have found that most people are pretty comfortable. They'll send an email, they'll send a Facebook message. Um, they could call me. I haven't got that many phone calls. I think primarily it's been social media, text messages, that kind of thing, if people have reached out. Um, have you gotten stopped at the grocery store yet? Um, Not really at the grocery store, but a lot while I was at the bank. <laughs> I would try to, you know, unfortunately, you know, like, this hey, if you, w- yeah. if you want to chat, let's give me a call, send me an email or I'll come for coffee or I just, this is my paid job. I can't be, you know, doing these two things at the same time. Like general comments are totally, we're totally fine. But as far as getting into deep talks about their tax notices it's not the time and place i think again or are will people will be, will be able to will are willing to give you their feedback on issues that are going on in wembley yeah usually like a, especially in a small town that's it's about the roads it's about the the ice rinks not open yet or it's about uh facilities in town or things like that like they definitely will reach out but they're I think more recently, I've had a couple of people reach out, unfortunately, about is there something the town can do to help like their funding's been cut or their 
uh, for important programming and stuff like that. And I think I've gotten more of the, how would you put it? it gives, the heartbreaking good, things. <laughs> the heartbreaking things. Yeah. What, you, you lead into my last question in this segment before we mm -hmm. turn to the town of Wembley. And it's my, it is probably one of my favorite questions to ask on this show because you know, as a municipal councilor, your jurisdictional roles and responsibility of what the municipality has to provide and what they're sort of, what they have to do to ensure good governance. But residents, and I say this as the host, not as the councilor, but residents will often blur those lines so they'll come talk to you about provincial issues my funding mm -hmm. got cut provincially so what can you do about it mm -hmm. how do you deal with issues that are not in your jurisdictional purview because i can imagine you don't want to blow someone off and say this isn't my job this isn't my responsibility here's your mla's phone number here's your mp's phone number go call them what do you do in that situation i like to think that we can still be partners and advocates for the same source. So there's been situations where I said, this is your MLA, this is your, but I do see those people probably more than they're going to see them face to face. So remembering when I am going to, you know, um, go for a walk through with the tourism minister, whatever it is that's coming up, tell me what's going on. I, you know, we're going to be having a coffee and going for a walk. Let's, I will, mention to them or maybe start the conversation with them about what your issue is. I might not be able to give you the money. We don't, unfortunately, we have also had funding cuts. So <laughs> if the money was there, I would, you know, Oprah, everybody, like you get a, <laughs> <laughs> everyone gets their funding increase. Right? This like, year. Unfortunately, that is not a possibility, but at the very least, I think my, one of my hopes is to be, uh, um, sorry, one of my hopes as a counselor is to be kind of the voice or to try to voice some of those concerns or problems that maybe people can't get their voice out there. So hopefully that's what I can do. I'm still learning like the routes and the how to get there, but it's I, the goal. <laughs> I, I appreciate your honesty and I appreciate your true honest answer there. I want to turn to the next segment because I'm cautious of time and I want to talk about the town because I feel like this is where a lot of discussion is going to happen. Um, before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it, though, by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and their opinion alone. There, She has one vote on the council. That's it. Counselor, with that being said now, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Wembley as of recording this episode today? I think we have a lot of the same issues as big centers right now on a much smaller budget. So the big issue or one of the big issues we're facing is definitely budget. We've been doing interim budget now for what feels like a lifetime. Um, and it's stressful, you know, you want to keep those service levels to where they, they should be, and you want to keep the programming and the, um, social aspects of your community, but having the funds to do that sometimes and being able to provide that it, it's becoming tight for not just us, but rural Alberta in general. I know we're all feeling the squeeze of providing that and staying, staying alive in a time that's kind of pushing us to the brink of not being viable anymore, which is kind of causing some anxiety around the table, I think for sure. Um, the other can thing I, I think- just, Can I just clarify something for a second? I I, I, I I traditionally never do this in this in this part of the show, but I, I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that the town of Wembley could be unviable in the future if the current path proceeds? Or are you saying that- other municipalities might be feeling the squeeze. I just want to make sure I, I think I, we're I all that. I think we're all just looking to the future and saying how can we stay okay this town not as an identity not just not just the town of Wembley but how we identify as you know being a small town that provides a lot to their community and how do we still attract people to come here because of those things. Right now I think people come here because 
we can and we have been able to find creative ways to still put on great events and have our sporting like you know soccer and basketball and all of these items and I think people that's what they're here for and we need to keep providing that to keep you know we want them to be happy here not just live here but have pride in their community I appreciate your uh, your response to that because I just wanted to make sure I understood what you're yeah. talking about before yeah. before this goes out and someone says, what do you mean? We're going to be going under? No, <laughs> we're just saying that things are getting no. tougher there. <laughs> so the million dollar follow-up question to that answer though has to be, what do you do as counsel, as counselor in the short term? Because money's not just going to magically appear on your doorstep tomorrow and everything's going to be solved. Unfortunately, as much as we mm -hmm. want Oprah Winfrey to come down, to right. and give us all these this yeah. money. Somebody has her phone number. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have to live in the here and now. So what are you looking at? What is the town of Wembley looking at to get through these sort of economic uncertainties without doing it on the backs of the residents? Because as much as municipalities are struggling, people are struggling as yeah. well. We've definitely been trying to be very creative. We've looked into grants. We've looked into cuts. We've looked into cutting back um, squeezing every department, every budget line. We've gone through it over and over. They've been going through it line item by line item, like what's essential, what do we not need? Where are some things where we can, um, for instance, cutting back on like not going to conferences when not necessary, um, not doing extra training that's not necessary, showing that we are dedicated to getting those budget line items as low as possible. We don't want to raise the taxes. Again, you know, for all of us around the table, those are not just our community's taxes. Those are our friends' taxes, our our parents, you know, seniors, our parents that are seniors that are living on minimal amounts to begin with. We don't want to put that extra stress on anyone either. So yeah, I Does think it that's get been... easier to make those tough choices? Because no, I don't <laughs> I love the, I love, I love just that. Nope. Nope. It, really? I mean, I don't think it's ever easy to say we have to cut this department back and we have to say no to this ask and we have to cancel all of this and, and not take away from the community. I don't think that's ever going to be an easy. And I think when it does become easy, there's something wrong. Give me some light though. Give me some hope that Wembley is able to navigate these sort of economic weathers that we're going through right now. Do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? Are you seeing some hope that, because you can only cut so much before you get to a point when there's nothing left on the skin. So you have to leave sort of something for people to feel like their, their tax dollars are being utilized yeah. correctly. Because as much as we all think pipes are great and water are great and roads are great, the average resident also wants to know that their library is funded, their yeah. community centers are able to be accessed, their walking tracks, their parks are being maintained. How much is too much? And where is the point where you say, okay, I think we've gotten to the point where we're sustainable and we can start moving ahead together? 100%. Uh, again, like we've been very creative and very lucky with some of the grants that we've received. So last year we started doing sidewalks. Um, we are a very small town. And when this, when this town came up, there were no sidewalks. Um, that was one of the biggest things I heard when I was running for council was when are we going to get sidewalks? We want the kids to have somewhere to walk. We want seniors to have something to walk on. That's not just the street. And last year we did a good portion of our sidewalks leading up to our elementary school. And we still have some grant money left for that. We're hoping to get maybe some more of that done as long as um, kind of in the budget, we can use that for what we originally planned for and not put it somewhere else. But um, we have some pretty good walking trails in town that have been utilized a lot. We have a great public works department that keeps those trails plowed and cleared up. Sometimes you can't do a lot about some of the ice we get around here, but as safe as Welcome possible. to Alberta in winter time, everyone. Right? Like just when you get it cleared up and then it's going to freezing rain or something. Um, we had gotten grant money for a spray park that we opened up last year. So we have a dinosaur themed spray park. We have um, 
a massive amount of oil field business going on around us. And a lot of those companies are very generous for us. So um, we are looking at adding to some of our outdoor activity spots, hopefully in the near future. Um, so we've had our it, outdoor park. It brings up a good sort of segue mm -hmm. into the next question is, you've talked about one very big macro issue here, and that is the finances of a municipality. Mm -hmm. But the average resident, the average uh, users group, the average nonprofit who comes to municipalities looking for money, they have their own individual needs and wants. Mm -hmm. You as counselor have to make those tough decisions that we talked about earlier in the episode. You have to make those tough decisions to ensure that the long-term viability of the community stays the way that it needs to go, but you need to also worry about the here and now. So how do you balance, and yes, for those who are listening, I'm about to quote Spock from Star Trek, how do you outweigh the needs of the community with the needs of the one? Because everyone's individual issue is going to be the most pressing issue to them, but you at the end of the day have to make the tough decisions and say, John, as much as you want that sidewalk in your house, in front of your house, we can't do it this year. Maybe five years down the line, maybe 20 years down the line. But right now we have to worry about Sarah's uh, sidewalk near them because it's closer to the school. How do yeah. you balance individual issues when you're around the council table? I think a lot of us fall back to our strategic plan. Where do where did we think we needed to be in such and such time? And what were the priorities on that list? And where does this fall in that priorities? Otherwise, you very much can just struggle back and forth with like you said, how important is this compared to this? And how do you weigh that? Because of course the person asking you thinks theirs is the most important. But Especially coming when it comes to potholes. <laughs> that just an all around Alberta thing or that a... <laughs> That's an all around Canada thing. Right? And everybody judges your community by how many potholes they dodge when they get there. <laughs> but it must be challenging though. Because you have unconscious bias, as much as you want to try and look at the community as a whole, you have to try to figure out what the best path forward. And often, I'm assuming, and I've never watched every single one of your town council meetings, but I could assume your side doesn't always win. Your side doesn't always win. And you as a counselor then have to go out and sort of support what the council's motion has gone through. Is it hard in a small community to balance what council wants with what the community wants? To some degree, maybe. I mean, you're never going to know, honestly, you're never going to know what the best option is. You hope that the people around the table are in touch enough with the community that you can trust what your council is doing. And I think our council has been very, very good at that. And even if it's not maybe what I thought I wanted, I still 100% back what my council decides, knowing that I have 100% trust that they're doing what they think is in the best interest from the information that they have. I appreciate that. I've been accused on this show only talking about negative things when it comes to community. <laughs> so I'm going to flip the script a little bit here and say, what does Wembley do right? What is the accomplishments that you guys get right that you boast about when you talk to other municipal leaders from across the province or across Canada, or even when you're talking to people from outside your community, you say, you, you know what, your community is doing it right, Wembley's doing it better. What's the boast that you do about Wembley? Because I've only been on council for a short period of time. Well, I've you heard... have something. You have something. <laughs> I know as much yeah. as you use short period of time, you've got to have <laughs> something. No, for sure. I think that even in that short period of time, we've come a long way. We've come into this um, table of people who just, like I said, we very much respect each other. I think that there's very little, like, should, there's always disagreement and that's a healthy disagreement. But the point is that they're healthy disagreements. Everybody will sit and listen to each other respectfully. There's no, um, no like being, like not that I know that other councils have issues to any means but you know you hear of things where maybe people aren't so respectful around the table and I think we've been very fortunate that way um but Wembley does honestly a lot of things very well I've heard from um multiple people like Wembley is a neat place to come and visit we're very fortunate to be sitting right next to one of the richest dinosaur bone beds and the dinosaur museum and 
Um, we've recently acquired some animatronic dinosaurs we bring to events. Our spray park is dinosaur, dinosaur themed and we um, pending some creative funding and grant money. We'd like to go further on the path to be sort of a dinosaur hub and and like why not we are we have the pipestone dinosaur or pipestone rv park as well and um the museum does tours on the river and all kinds of neat things so there's lots of things that draw to this area in particular but Wembley is right in the middle of it it literally is in the name of your, it's the motto of your town, if I'm not mistaken, in the heart of the action for those who Very are watch, yeah. watching this. It's right behind the counselor's head. Um, yeah. you, you bring up tourism and yes, we're going to talk about tourism now because <laughs> this is my favorite subject because as I've promised on the show, if you, co if you come on the show, I come to your community. So get ready to see me in Wembley Perfect. and hopefully in the next few months. Actually, yeah. I'm going to be up there. when it's warmer. <laughs> <laughs> I will be up for the Grand Prairie uh, Winter Games. So I uh -huh. will be up there literally in a few weeks. By the time this is recording, I will be there. <laughs> so I've got to ask, besides grabbing a coffee with the counselor who's appearing on the show right now, what are some of the tourist destinations? What are some of the hidden gems that tourists need to see when they come through the town of Wembley? I'm a, uh, I'm sort of an outdoor enthusiast. So I guess it depends on what you're coming for this area for. I would hope if you're coming, it's because you want to go down to the river. You want to experience the dinosaur museum. Maybe if it were summertime, maybe you want to go on the uh, river rafting tour and go to the bone beds. Or for myself, it's just walking the trails, going to the, we have Sunset Park that's beautiful. Uh, in the summertime, the spray park there. Um, I like my cross crunchy skis and I like snowshoeing. So um, given there's enough snow, which we do not have right now. <laughs> you guys don't have a lot of snow up there right now? No, 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 no. We got our first little bit of snow in the last week, I think. For someone who's about to make that drive up to Grand Prairie and Wembley, I'm so happy about that. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. If you're coming towards Edmonton way, that way was icy this week, but um, our... Oh. Like it was the first week though that we've really had to worry about it. It's been crazy warm, like plus five. <laughs> like I couldn't believe the weather that we've had. But again, I haven't taken advantage of any winter sports and it was minus 50. So there was no going outside snowshoeing for me. <laughs> Curled in front so, of the fireplace only. <laughs> so where do you go in the community? Where do you go to decompress? After a long day of council meetings and I'm assuming you've just gone through budget sessions. So that means that long, long days of council meetings, if you haven't already passed it, um, where do you go to decompress in your community and just recenter yourself? Because you know, tomorrow you're going to be back at it, trying to make Wembley a better place. Honestly, I think just home. Like my family is here. Home in my pajamas is my favorite place to be. <laughs> But uh, my in-laws live just outside of town too, and they have a farm, an acreage out there, and they have walking trails and stuff. And it's always very calming and kind of feel like you're outside of any sort of chaos. It was the perfect place during the pandemic. We would go out and walk and berry pick, and you could just kind of forget what was going on in the world. And I think that's still kind of the general feeling. If things are crazy, you just go be with your family and enjoy some outdoors. So I started this conversation talking about you. We're ending this conversation talking about the town. And I'm going to ask the million dollar question I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show, who's a municipal leader. But what makes your community such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think what's unique about us, besides the fact that you're just kind of a neat little town, like every little town. I think it's neat that you know your neighbors, that there's lots of events going on. But we've been very fortunate that we can continue to provide some really cool things. Like our library puts on amazing, amazing programming. Our getting tongue tied parks and recreation. <laughs> if you come here in the summertime, our fields are filled. We put on soccer um, for all ages. She has a floor hockey team that she puts on she does dance she does uh yoga for kids we have pickleball in the gym we have so 
very inclusive to everyone in the community. I think like whether you're a senior and you want to go play pickleball, you want to walk on the trails, you have young kids and you want to do events. We got to showcase the street performers last year um, between the town and the library. So we had big events like that with food trucks. Our egg society puts on great events. I think what's unique is, yeah, you're in a small town, but you have access to all of these things. And you know what? If you don't have access to it here, you're only 15 minutes away from the city. Which for those who are listening, the biggest city near you is Grand Prairie. Yeah. Um, Councillor, I want to thank you. Um, the last 30, 35 minutes or so has been probably one of the most enlightening moments of my life. And it seems like you truly have a passion for your community. It seems like you truly have a uh, desire to make your community better. And it seems like you're doing it under the truest of intentions. So thank you so much for serving. And thank you so much for being part of the show. Thanks so much, Christopher. Thank you so much for joining in today's episode. If you have found this episode sparking your interest, hit that subscribe button today. Stay in the loop with our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations like you saw today on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and maintenance of this crucial show. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies our depth and breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.